Before I start this letter, I just want to say thanks to everyone who's been engaged with my content so far. I really appreciate the feedback and support. If you could ask a favor, send us to your friends, to Discord servers, group chats, and your Zoom classes. There's a lot I want to say to you all. Dear Gen Z, we've been called digital natives, post millennials, Zoomers, and even I generation, which. Ugh, it's quite a nice topic if you think about it. Like, are we really going to be named after a trillion dollar corporation? But anyway, I digress. I'm writing this to say that I, I see you. We may be facing different individual battles, but I think we share a collective anxiety, a mourning about the state of the world and our future, a sense of doom and growing hopelessness. Some are clinging to a fantasy while others are utterly depressed. Y'all know who y'all are. Somewhere in the fuzzy generation borders of... 1995 and 2012. I see you. Let's talk about you. Or the story of us, really. First, we were born. Duh. For the early Zoomers, we probably witnessed in real time the shift in technology through our childhoods. The old and the new. The Nokia, the Blackberry, and the iPhone. Corporal punishment before was banned in schools. Blackboards, whiteboards, and smartboards. The 90s classics and the 2000s hits. Arthur, Sesame Street, Spongebob, and all that jazz. We don't really remember 9-11, but we do remember the recession and the impact it had on our lives. Some of us, <clears throat> like myself, are crippled by nostalgia. Alas, if only I could go back to walking down the street with everybody that I meet having an original point of view, or venturing between the lions. It couldn't last. About teen years, we wake up a bit to reality. Or maybe you were still in bliss, I don't know you. Maybe you still are in bliss in which case I kind of envy you. We struggle with mental illness and are totally used to a world in perpetual war. The Economist has described Gen Z as more educated, well-behaved, stressed, and depressed. Thankfully, a lot of us are also open-minded and compassionate, leading movements after all. We recognize the pressures to either do things we're passionate about or actually survive, and it's tough. For a lot of us, even stable employment is a distant dream. No matter how hard we work, the system is kind of rigged against us. We desensitize to global civil unrest, corruption, crime, war, poverty, and inequality. The generations before us don't seem to care or understand us. Well, maybe millennials. But a lot of our parents act as if the world works the way it might have for them. They act like our condition is a choice. It's like we have no mouth and kind of scream. We get hit by a pandemic, and if you didn't realize before, then around then you probably realized a certain uncomfortable truth. We're in a bit of a mess. According to Nature's scientific reports, the chance of catastrophic collapse coming in the next couple of decades is about 90%. By 2050, 90% of our seafood populations will face collapse if these trends continue, and 25% of the world depends on fish. Sea levels are going to rise between 1 to 3 meters this century. We're already experiencing the sixth mass extinction on Earth. We're facing extreme droughts. Nine of the 50 known Earth tipping elements that regulate the state of the planet have already been activated. Climate change is happening right now. And even if we reached net zero carbon emissions today, global warming would continue to happen for the next few decades or centuries. It will take far more than 30 years to transition to net zero emissions. And if we want to hold warming below 2 degrees Celsius, emissions would need to be cut in half between 2020 and 2030. We'll probably lose the Amazon, Antarctica, and Arctic before then. If you go much above 2 degrees Celsius, we'll quickly get to 4 degrees Celsius anyway because of the tipping point in feedback loops. And a 4 degrees Celsius warmer world would hardly sustain even 1 billion people. So we should be declaring a state of planetary emergency and acting drastically. But our bloated society is living on borrowed time, and the boomers are arguing about whether or not science is real because it'll hurt their profits. Collapse is already happening and will continue to happen in different places and at different times. The big picture may not come together until much later. And yet, Greenpeace has said that to solve climate change, we have no alternative but to build a global grassroots movement, move politicians forward, and force corporations and banks to change direction. I mean, we see the naivety in that, right? It's a refusal to recognize the real problem or confront the real solution. You gotta ask yourself, who's doing the majority of the emitting and consuming? Between 1990 and 2015, the richest 10% of the world accounted for over half of the emissions added to the atmosphere. That's what's up. Our generation grew up on dystopian media. 
Maze Runner, Hunger Games, Divergent. I mean, this is real life, bro. A bit boring, not as flashy, perhaps. But it's time to do what you gotta do. It's time for action. Civilization is unsustainable as is, and it was bound to fail. When you combine civilization with capitalism, worse yet. The gravity of the situation is really hard to comprehend, I know. I'm gonna try my best to break it down. But we can't keep worshipping progress, capitalism, and the free market. The titanic ship of progress is not unsinkable. Not all progress, technological or otherwise, is good for humanity or our planet. Living standards and economic growth of the global north are mere products of a pillaging, polluting, imperializing industrial civilization, producing a temporary middle class and a powerful elite. It's like we're living in a come down of a high, a high production, high consumption lifestyle that couldn't have lasted. The progress of the past was built by sacrificing the future, and that future is upon us. All complex civilization is reliant on a short-lived, rapidly dwindling energy source. Because our society is capitalist, profit is the prime directive, and as things collapse, Capitalists will look for ways to profit, from scarcity to crisis to disaster and conflict. Capitalism is quite good at dodging bullets and escaping temporary challenges to its legitimacy and viability. But the global scope of capitalism means that its consequences will not be limited. No way on earth has escaped the impact of capitalism. The results of two centuries of climate altering carbon will wreak havoc for generations to come. Thanks to capitalism, we're grappling with mounting inequality and wealth concentration, while us at the bottom struggle to get by. Globally, the top 80 people have more wealth than the bottom 3.5 billion people. And that was before the pandemic. In 2017, 82% of the global wealth created went to the top 1%. And they have been thriving since lockdown. All basic needs are in private hands, so capitalism can maintain its required underclass and required pool of unemployed. It requires a police force to fill prison beds for profit and be down anyone who rises up, while corporations loot our tax dollars. With every riot, they clutch their pearls, weep, and demand blood because some poor person got a TV, while every night, people go to bed poisoned, poorly educated, hungry, sick, and houseless. Empires, British, American, and otherwise, continue to oppress and extract from whole continents and peoples, directly and indirectly, while people revel in the pain of the victims. Victims of police violence, sexual assault, environmental racism, war crimes, and otherwise. Reforms aren't enough, yet they barely even want reform. They'd rather beat people down. But hey, slave empire heirs can shoot cars in space though, right? It's like a carnival of opulence and violence, dressed up all pretty. We're just animals on a farm to them. Livestock to be worked, fleeced, and slaughtered. Commodities. As the White House put it, human capital stock. Don't you dare try to escape. They want us to heal the free market, but never question who it's free for. There's no real freedom in poverty or wage slavery. There's no real freedom in polluted air or poisoned water. There's no real freedom when everything you need to live has been hoarded long before you were born. Capitalism is incompatible with a well-functioning society and earth. Sad part is, collectively, we have the capacity to truly confront this system and this crisis. The only problem is we're fragmented by borders and categories. We're crippled by imaginary lines and antagonistic nations, ruled by corrupt elites who care more about power and wealth. We stay fixated on, oh, but it might cost too much, as if the future damage will cost mere pennies. I feel like a lot of you already knew this though. It probably feels like there's nothing we can do. Things look bleak and I don't want to feed you lies. That's why I'm writing this letter. I've seen the beams. I still had to talk about wishing for things to go back to normal and for 2020 to be over. But unfortunately, it's not so simple. We need to face reality and I can't mince words here. Things are on a decline and the 2020s are gonna be worse. So, what do we do? Well, boy, I know what we can't do. We can't keep our heads in the sand. Some people don't seem to be able to break the brainwashing and none of us are immune to propaganda. I mean, denial is a stage of grief, and we're all at different stages of our collective grieving process, but we don't have time to stay in denial. Every day counts. I couldn't find exact stats, or stats that don't include Gen Alpha, but 15 to 24-year-olds and 5 to 14-year-olds make up 32.27% of the global population. That's over 2.5 billion people. Collectively, we're a force to be reckoned with. Throughout history and throughout the world, young people have made a difference. There's a lot we can learn from the past century of resistance. We can't forget that we're human beings, first and foremost. 
nations, races, and religions are all secondary social constructs to our very essence. We need to move beyond these structures that manipulate our lives and reject propaganda. We need to cooperate across boundaries. It's time we got together to shape our fate. To mitigate this crisis, we're going to need to dismantle capitalism, which is no easy feat, so I've been told. Capitalist civilization didn't succeed everywhere at once and it won't break down everywhere at once. But our future, wherever we're from, must be post-growth, post-capitalist, post-industrial and post-depression. Global revolution is unlikely, but there are always places to go to and live in and love in and resist from. And we can extend those spaces. The global situation may seem beyond us, but the local never is. So think locally. Not in a xenophobic way, but in a let me see how I can help my neighbors, friends, and family prepare kind of way. Our challenge is to create our local future and not let the future create us. Other than mitigation, we're going to need to learn to adapt to our changing climate. Not just as individuals. After all, sitting in a cabin fighting off marauders just isn't sustainable or ethical. We need to relearn the skills our ancestors once knew. Together, our collective energy is our hope, our nature, honestly. We need to reweave our connections and build a clear vision, together. That's where true resilience lies. And we'll need resilience for what's coming. Look around you. Are there people in your community who can build or repair or weld? Any gardeners or cooks? Water collection, filtration, distribution and sanitation systems, as well as food preservation and medicine development, are critical especially. We don't want people dying of some 18th century disease. Learn as much as you can from the people around you and work with them. Collect books and resources. Think of how you can specialize to help your community. Personally, I'm looking into planning, communication systems, consensus, anarchism, and permaculture. Maybe you could focus on first aid, animal rearing, or peacekeeping. Invest in sustainability. Build networks of interreliance. We're social creatures at our core. That's how we've managed to survive for this long. In tight-knit groups, we're great at solving problems. If you need to start somewhere, start with your friends. Share this video with them, dig into the vast scope of knowledge out there, and get to work. Build local, produce local, and meet local needs. We can build semi-autonomous communities built on consensus and chosen kinship. I believe in us. Peace. Well, Lana, I have some channel announcements I'd like to make. Firstly, I hit 1,000 subs last week, so thank you, thank you, thank you. My goal was to hit 1,000 subs by the end of the year, so I really appreciate it. Also, thanks so much to my first two patrons, Andrad and Adrian. I really appreciate it. I've got my first ever post on Patreon up, something I wrote in a different headspace. So if you want to take a peek at my other work and get a special thanks, check it out. Go to patreon.com slash saintdrew. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow Gen Z. Feed the algorithm. Check out my previous videos for the fascinating topics. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore saintdrew. And check out my monthly blog posts on Trinidadian politics and stuff on saint-drew.medium.com. Thanks again. Peace.